stocks back from the brink with a big question mark. And that's our topic for today. Johnny Scan, so good that you could be here. Great to be here, Professor. I'm very excited about this show. I got a little taste of it and I'm very excited. Well, we, uh, we're going to go back to that whole topic of tight money timing to start. And then we're going to finish up with the power charting trend model and spend as much time as we can on that. And I really want uh, John's help with that because we're going to have him concoct for us some really super good scans in the future. And I'm committing you to that on the air, John. I'm accepting the challenge. The gauntlet has been thrown and I'm in 100%. Sweet. All right. Well, so here, uh, interesting development in the yield curve, which in this case, we're looking at the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield to the three-month T-bill yield. And this week, we had this go uh, slightly negative. And so the yield curve is flat, we would say, at this point in time. And so we uh, look at this as a recession warning when this happens. It doesn't mean it happens right away, but that is a t definitely a tight money environment. But the question I have for today, and this is a question for John and for all of us, is, is this truly a tight money environment? And so we're going to come back to a chart we looked at last time and uh, really have a uh, a deep dive into that very topic. Also, I want to show you an update on this 20-year U.S. Treasury bond point and figure chart. And uh, you can see the green shaded area is a the distributional top at the end of 2021. And this created a gigantic count that went all the way from a high in an upthrust of 152 down to 101 to 91, truly a bridge too far. It's like nobody could have possibly believed that that could happen, except it was in the counts in the market. And so look what happened, John. We just went down, cascaded into a low at 92. So pretty impressive decline. Uh, 62 TLT points. So quite substantial. Big move. Uh, talked with a, uh, a portfolio manager today who uh, was uh, marveling at the decline of the, not marveling, maybe a little pained, at the 60-40 uh, allocation model, which is 60 stocks, 40 bonds. And we can see that the bond market was of no help in 2022. And uh, so, but here's the good news is that we have a low of 91 on this count, a, a, a range from 101 to 91 with a redistribution count to 93, which goes right into the middle of this objective range. And so that's a stepping stone redistribution confirming count, kind of a mouthful, but I absolutely believe, John, that we could have a range bound market for a while, build a cause, which might be a cause for either redistribution or potentially accumulation. So I do think that for the time being, the bond market is gonna be range bound. Your thoughts? Well, it's amazing that the count worked out so well, and we're beginning the process of a confirming count, uh, which is always further evidence that uh, we found a level that's going to be respected for some period. It's just amazing how big of a drop that was over that period of time, and the count was there. And uh, I've been saying for 40 years with my point and figure uh, buddies, it's like it's just, isn't it just amazing that this stuff works. <laughs> so, just amazed. I'm just amazed. Anyway, um, here we saw this chart last week. I've made a few additional upgrades. I want to uh, bring this up to date. I really want John's thoughts on this, starting with this quote from William McChesney Martin, Fed chief for 19 years, 
And he's the one that talked about removing the punch bowl. And it's been convoluted into a number of different, uh, a number of different kind of sayings, but all basically the same as like the Fed's job is to remove the punch bowl when the party gets to marry. And so here we can see that uh, in prior periods, and I'm going to talk about these two bear markets again, but very briefly, and that is, is that John, you can see this black line here is the Fed funds rate. The red line is the two year US Treasury yield. And I would contend that when you get the, the uh, Fed funds rate above the two year, that that is a tight money environment. And note how we had tight money for the entire last leg up of the bull market in 2000. And so that, in fact, notice how the market became kind of uh, uh, labored in its final rise up to the final peak. And money, the Fed was demonstrably uh, restrictive at that time. So, uh, and then you can see, we call this period a tight money period. And uh, so that now uh, let's look at what happened because the Fed started to ease and started to drop interest rates. But the whole time they're dropping rates during the beginning of the bear market, you have the two year also dropping and you can see the daylight between these two interest rate uh, data points all the way down. And it's not until you get to this area here where now you have Fed funds below the two-year rate, which sets up a easy money or an accommodative environment. And so uh, note how this sort of coincides with the last leg down in the beginning of the accumulation to start a new bull market is when the Fed becomes demonstrably accommodative. So uh, John, your thoughts? Well, if that's actually the pattern, uh, where we currently are seems to be pretty far away from a tight money environment. Very interesting with the red line above the black line here uh, of late so such a good point such a good point so uh just to um now turn to this 2007 8 bear market note the tight money conditions that occurred here in the last leg up and this big gap between the fed funds and the two year tight money conditions so the fed is being preemptive i think john and uh, so you can see from that, that with the Fed being preemptive, that they're trying to take away the punch bowl while the party is hardy. And uh, that would be my perspective about this. Your thoughts? Well, I think there's a unique factor occurring now, which is the uh, production and liquidity through quantitative tightening. So there's really more than one avenue of uh, monetary restriction besides the Fed funds. It's a quantitative tight tightening. Good, also, we haven't seen that one before. That's going to be an interesting. It's kind of a new, uh, a, a new addition. And, and maybe we, and in prior periods of quantitative tightening, the market hasn't been very happy about it. And so, uh, <clears throat> Just to complete this thought, you can see here accommodation occurs right down here, easy money, <clears throat> Fed funds gets below the two year, and that is the beginning of an accumulation structure for an important new bull market. And your point is so good here because we do see in fact that the two year remains way above the Fed funds rate at this time. And I've updated this data, <clears throat> which was not updated last week. And so you can see that the spread is still quite wide. Three and a quarter percent Fed funds. Likely the Fed's going to go to four at the next meeting, which is early November. But I suspect, which will still have it be below the two-year Treasury yield. But 
I believe that would be right here, by the way, that the uh, Fed, by this definition, is not really, they're still effectively accommodative. They're not tight in their monetary position yet. And an example of that would have been this period right here, which is around 1995, 96, 94, 95. And that is, is that you have the, the Fed funds below the two year. And <clears throat> even though rates are rising, the market is getting ready to go into a primary uptrend. I'm wondering, big question mark, is whether or not this is uh, maybe not that hostile of an environment for the stock market, that conditions are still such that the stock market is attractive compared to all of the other possible asset classes that people could invest in. And that would be certain stocks, which I think we're going to talk about more today. So it's a tough it's a tough sell when you can have four percent on a three month treasury. That would be my concern about the stock market from a yield perspective. <clears throat> yes, just based on yield. So it would have to be a total return comparative where you have appreciation plus yield would constitute a better return than that. And that's certainly not the case at this point, for sure. So <clears throat> now here, uh, I want to talk about stocks back from the brink is if we look here at and we look at this chart, gosh, lately, just about every week. And right here, we notice that we have a sharp rally in the S&P right back up under this uh, oversold line. And it's trying to get back up into the channel. And uh, this, to me, defines the brink. And I think that any further break below this area signals a secular shift from bull to potentially bear. And that uh, we want to see the market. I mean, if you're, I'm, I'm demonstrably a bull at heart. But if we want to see the market maintain its upward stride, it really needs to perform and get back into the channel here in short order. So uh, I, that's what I think back from the brink means, is whether or not this in fact can happen. Certainly looking over the precipice right now. So oh, definitely needs work. And I, this market reminds me so much of the dot-com era 2000, 2003. If you look at these big growth names that were so hot in the bull market, they are down so much. The FANG stocks, the junior FANGs, they have just taken such a beating. And this is this indicator right here, the NASDAQ 100. And this is actually through the today, the day of the recording, October 27th. And notice how it just, and these stocks have taken a hit in the last couple of days based on earnings, John. And look at how they're just hanging here under this trend line. So the NASDAQ stocks don't look so good to me. No, there certainly is potentially some rotation out of those names uh, at this point. And for example, Meta just dropped over 24%, I believe, at or near 24% uh, on earnings. So very difficult environment for the big techs. Now, what's the alternative? And you can see here that the area that has really been favored has been the Dow Jones Industrials. So these are the 30 top really blue chip names. And they came down and touched their long-term 10-year or so demand trend line. And then look at this incredible monthly bar. These are monthly bars. Look at this monthly bar that has almost completely taken back the September bar, which was September was the worst month of the year for performance. And so, I mean, just really just a, a remarkable reversal. And so makes sense. Money flow is back towards value, blue chip quality, and away from the more speculative growth elements of the market. 
in my estimation, looking at this chart. I concur, Professor. Now, let's move on to the uh, oh, last thing let's update here is really the uh, seasonality. This is something we looked at in the, starting in, I think, late August. This is the midterm election year seasonality, 72 years, but it's only the midterm years. And we can see that uh, big decline in the, in the beginning of the year, another big decline April to June, another decline August to September, best quarter of the year in the seasonality model. And it doesn't have to happen this way, but it's interesting because when we lay over the market here, which is uh, really through a day or so ago, note the uh, similarity of the highs and lows throughout with seasonality chart making a minor new low right at the end of September. And we talked about this really uh, it, late August, early September, about how it was the end of the quarter. And in fact, you can see here, minus 9.34% for the S&P uh, in the month of September, worst month of the year. And it gave us what could be constituted as a spring. And now a rally is being attempted right clocking in with the seasonality turning up in the fourth quarter. So uh, we may have some positive surprises here, John. Would be nice for change. Absolutely, it would. And so the seasonality chart has just been really uh, very helpful this year. And then finally, looking at the green shoots, uh, we talked about this, I think, some last week. The uh, green shoots were in a rising scale, higher lows. This is the NASDAQ uh, internal breadth, 50-day, stocks of other 50-day. Here is the index itself, NDX in this case. And then over here, this is so fascinating to me, John. This is stocks above their 200-day. And what is the conclusion we can draw if we have a June low and then we have a higher low in September when we have a lower low spring type event in the indexes and we have stocks above their 200 day making a higher low and rising? What, uh, what would we conclude from that? Well, we're going to have a rally, maybe a counter trend rally in nature, but we do see some of the uh, breath indicators indicating positive outcome consistent with seasonality. Very interesting. Well, and I think that the higher low in the 200 day, the stocks of other 200 day, the, these NASDAQ stocks aren't, remember, breath is one stock, one boat. And there, there's a number of stocks that are making higher lows and getting above their 200-day, a measure of an uptrend. But they're not these big mega cap names, which are way below their 200 days. It's got to be the value segment of the NASDAQ, which are smaller market cap. And maybe they're not small cap, but they might be the, the forgotten names. They might be the banks, and it might be heavy construction and steel stocks and things like that. And so this is what's so interesting is I think this is a measure of rotation that's occurring. And so uh, I now the other thing we have that we did talked about last week is we need directionality. And now we have directionality in these indicators because they are heading north. So we have positive divergence and directionality, which is a really great combination for a more important rally. And uh, so with that, let's turn our attention to the trend model. And just as a reminder, we are focused on the idea of when you have the, this is weekly data and relative strength, that when you get the relative strength above a rising moving average and you have price above a rising moving average, 
Those are the two preconditions for an important uptrend that can persist for a long time. And so with that in mind, John, I let's pause and uh, put up a screen of stocks that are percolating to the top right now. So in the weeks ahead, we're going to have John show us scans that can give us these trend characteristics of these emerging campaignable trends, long-term trends that emerge and start to persist as a new uptrend is taking place, potentially with the idea looking at seasonality that we could have a, a potential not this is a completely speculative statement we could have a rally phase that goes into the new year and so uh uh ex exactly the reasons for that is uh you know we can talk about the fed and everything else but we just when we act on the evidence uh that suggests that uh there is the potential for some kind of a rally phase in here john how would we tackle the scanning uh, elements for uh, finding these emerging leadership industry groups and stocks? Well, we start with a list of the industry groups and then we run scans on the list. I think we've made the list public before. There's over a hundred industry groups. Here we see about 15 or 16 that meet the criteria for uh, an uptrend with relative strength and 39-week uh, price average being the main considerations there. 16 out of over 100, very, very low percentage. So we're quite early in the process. So deeply oversold market, would you say? Deeply oversold. But now is the time when you really want to start thinking about outperformance because outperformance in the bad times can produce superior results when things do turn around. So very important to look and quite easy with the stock chart scan engine. Oh, my gosh. Looking and forward. So true. And so we look forward to you uh, developing these scans with us. Now, the thing is, is that you always want to identify leadership. This is a great way to identify leadership. These are the, the industry groups that meet my criteria for an uptrend. And there's only 15 of them here if you take out UUP. And this is out of over 100. And so here is where the emerging leadership is. And every week we need to check to see whether there's new leadership emerging. And a week ago, this number was nine. And so little by little, if this is a good uptrend, it, the list is going to become bigger. And so, John, do you see any themes in here? Well, certainly uh, energy, oil equipment, integrated exploration, very much at the top of the list. And we would expect that from what we see. Defense, um, we've had some interesting performance in defense. Heavy construction has been an interesting theme. I did purchase uh, one stock, MCOR, based on its performance and the industry group performance. So this is really a way to point yourself in the direction of better potential opportunity. Anything can happen at any time, but better potential opportunity is grounded in the performance of the industry's uh, which to which those uh, stocks pertain. Would you agree? Yes, yes, absolutely. And this reminds me, John, so much of that 2000 to 2002 period where the dot-com stocks really just melted down. And in the meantime, the forgotten, unwashed, blue chip value names were uh, building uh, an an interest by institutions. And it was uh, uh, themes like energy and uh, banking. And in that time, home building, maybe not so much yet here, but home builders. And it was uh, 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 
insurance stocks. Insurance stocks today are doing quite well. And some materials names. Notice paper uh, total return market index is in this list. So it's one of the early materials themes that's popping up. Now, we're going to do a 10 minute overtime segment and keep talking about this. And so we're going to pause here and uh, take a quick break and come back and keep this discussion going and look at some of the themes available to us. So hang on. Welcome back. We're in the overtime segment for power charting and I'm with uh, Johnny Scan, John Colucci and uh, John, uh, which industry group here would you like to look at? Let's go down the list a little bit. Number five, defense index. That's right been here. a very interesting area of late. Let's see whether it meets our criteria for a confirmed uptrend. Here is U.S. defense index, DJU SDN. And remember the characteristics that we need to see. You can see them over here is price above its 39 and the relative strength above its 39. And we would then look for a persistent ongoing uptrend. Look at this climax right here in the relative strength in 2018 and comes with somewhat of a climax in price. And that changes the whole nature of the way that the defense stocks trade. Coming to the present here, you can see that defense stocks start to move up in early 21, but the relative strength doesn't start turning up until early 22, and we go into a reaccumulation. Well, now look what's happening is, is the reaccumulation completed with like a spring type event here at the end and a very sharp rally. What do you think of this rally, John? Well, very interesting. We're supported by a almost parabolic move in the relative strength. We're testing the 39-week average. And look at what a beautiful entry that test uh, has provided for folks there in really an interesting little structure that resembles backup action in a much larger structure, perhaps going all the way back to 2018 and forward. So a lot of potential there, a lot of cost. Now, one thing that we might look for would be uh, after a breakout is some kind of a pause, change of character in that the pause is narrow, shallow, brief, and uh, doesn't come back in appreciably into this trading area, this reaccumulation area, if that's in fact what it is, and then starts to go again. And so we always give the benefit of the doubt to the rising trend. And any pullbacks in the uptrend, especially with the support of relative strength, is a buying opportunity. So let's now turn to the stocks in the group. And what uh, I think, John, I like to, to rank them by the scooter. And I know that you do also. And you also use scanning criteria for ranking. Uh, I think for the, the, the case for finding the stocks that are above their relative strength, Scooter is a super good tool. Very good tool. Absolutely. What stock would you like to look at here? I've been keeping my eye on the Huntington Ingalls stock, um, mid cap, just under 90 on the Scooter. So it's got a little bit of room to work there. Why don't right we take the, a look at that one? And we would say from the scooter reading, fifth from the top, that this is one of the leadership stocks, I would say, in defense. It is. Yeah. So let's have a look. So what are your thoughts? Well, very similar family resemblance to the industry group itself. We are uh, moving up and away from a rising 39-week average. Just had a nice... Uh, powerful bar up and out of a smaller structure. Look at that beautiful slope on the relative strength line and um, moving average up. All signs positive here. How much more? Difficult to tell. This week's bar is showing a little bit of supply, but that I think might be the consolidation or 
uh, slight reversion after the breakout because we did have a breakout last week. Your thoughts, Professor? <clears throat> well, I'm seeing reaccumulation here across this area from mid-22 back to mid-21. So that has uh, definitely the characteristic of reaccumulation after a good rally in 20 to 21. Now a jump out and a backup at larger resistance, which is a little above this area. It's at resistance right now, actually. But this is very constructive because look at how it can't come back into the zone of the reaccumulation. Relative strength continues to be dominant. So this looks great to me. And uh, so it just needs to prove that it can get above any supply that exists at the early 2020 high. And, uh, and then I expect it to continue leadership uh, in, in the defense group. So as a defense group is leading, I expect the stock will lead with it. I would also point out is notice how the relative strength fails in early 18. And it relative strength cannot really appreciably get above. Here it tried for a little bit. So that could have been a buying uh, signal for us because we operate almost. This is one of the things I like about this model. It's very uh, clear about where the buying and the selling points are. But uh, down it goes again, persistently declining. And so now we have everything in gear again, and it appears that we have persistency of the uptrend. So I like this a lot, John, and uh, think that it's got some uh, great potential uh, ongoing. Absolutely. So uh, now, just for the heck of it, let's go down towards the lower end of the scooter ratings and let's look at, it's a little bit hard because it's not a big group, and these are small cap, but uh, here's a um, scooter reading around 65, BAE Systems. Let's see what we have here. Well, notice that this is flirting more with the 200, or the 39 at this point, and you have the uptrend consistent and persisting, and up it goes. Uh, so I would say this looks pretty attractive. And this is pretty far down the list. So, uh, okay. And uh, just uh, just pause for a sec. We'll be right back. Okay, thank you. We're back. I want to now look at the S&P 500 individual stocks. And we can see that there are, again, 500 stocks. These are the bluest of the blue chips. And here they are in order of their scooter rank. Uh, we can, in fact, use the scanning engine to scan on an index. And uh, the S&P being one of them, the NASDAQ 100, uh, Johnny Scan can show us more about how to do that. Uh, but what I really want to do is to show you here, you can see of the 500, there's only 106 names that are on this list. And in fact, these are the stocks that meet our uh, are likely to meet our trend criteria based on scooter rank and also on uh, trend characteristics. And so uh, here we can see, looking at this, we can even sort by sectors and in industry, which uh, stocks are tending to dominate in this list of 100 names, a lot of energy and so on. And so uh, this is a uh, another great way to drill into the market. So let's just pick a stock here at 88.7 scooter is Archer Daniels. And we can just click on this and look at this chart. What do you think, John? Well, it's, it's got the look above a rising 39, almost parabolic move on relative strength and very, very, uh, nice old line blue chip company. A lot of good things here. Your thoughts, now, Professor? Yeah, only that there's a dip here. This is really a good case study because a little bit of a dip in the relative strength here in 21 into the end of the year. But note that price does not get below its rising 39. And so as long as you have price or relative strength continuing to respect its up uptrend, that we would continue to uh, remain with this position if we are in it. 
and we would be in it down probably right about here in mid 2020 is when you have in gear up price and relative strength. So beautiful uptrend, great example of how you can use this tool as a campaign tool. And it gives you uh, wonderful entry and risk management parameters. So I really love that. And uh, so, uh, John, any uh, last stocks you want to look at? We'll, we'll look at this list some more as we go through time. But uh, uh, I love Genuine Parts, number seven, has had okay. an interesting uh, move of late. Let's see what that looks like. Ooh, what do you think? Well, this one's off to the races. This is a. Uh, very significant and this group uh, AutoZone, O'Reilly there's been some interesting uh, action in this uh, sector and industry group your thoughts professor uh, again interesting example look uh, a year or more of downtrending relative strength we would stay away during that period we can see this in 16 17 same thing and here we have the opposite condition we flirt with the 39 from above in a good uptrend, and it flirts with this area, flattens it out, but it is able to maintain its level around the 39 and keep going, even though we got a little bit of a dip from the relative strength. So again, great campaign stock that's really been in an uptrend since the end of 2020. A uh, great example, John. Glad you uh, showed it to us. And uh, one potentially one more um one that i really uh, like to follow and trade at times is albemarle and you can see here that here's the beginning of an important uptrend in 2020 everything's in gear up here you have a little bit of a dip right here but look at this reaccumulation with a jump up and a shallow backup touches the 39 from above Relative strength is uh, persistently up, even when it dips below right here in early 22. Relative strength has not turned down the moving average. And so everything is in gear here. And now, what do you think, John? It's just bouncing around here, completing what looks like a possible reaccumulation. Absolutely. Reaccumulation is what I'd see here, too. So, John, I look forward to doing a lot more of this with you. I appreciate you being with us today. And uh, so thank you very much. Looking forward to it. And folks, we will see you all next time and do more long-term trend work on power charting. Thanks for being here. Hey guys, Dave Keller here with stockcharts.com. Thanks so much for watching our video. If you enjoyed it, and we hope you did, Hit the like button right below. Also, we have so much new content every day. Consider subscribing to the channel. Just hit the subscribe button in the video or right below. Thanks for watching. Stay safe. Have a fantastic day.